everyone. I am the Jane Harmon, the not-so-new president and CEO of the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, almost a year now. Time flies when you're having fun, and it truly is an honor uh, to succeed Lee Hamilton as head of this uh, extraordinary center. Um, today's panel has attracted uh, a a an enormous amount of press attention, as it should. The title is Israel, Iran, and the Arabs, a Regional Perspective. Uh, that is something uh, we surely need. Um, the the, the uh, presence of the press does remind me, however, that, uh, as I think everyone here knows, uh, a, a very uh, highly regarded uh, reporter and former Wilson scholar, Tony Shadid, uh, lost his life in Syria uh, last week. And just today, um, the news is that a uh, noted journalist and her photographer have been killed. These are people who obviously put themselves at risk to bring us accurate information. Um, the Wilson Center also endeavors to bring you uh, and the press and policymakers accurate information at obviously at less risk than those who are in war theaters. Uh, but we think it matters enormously to use the convening power of this nonpartisan institute uh, to provide what we call safe political space, where people from different countries with different perspectives can talk candidly and civilly, uh, isn't that refreshing, uh, about the important issues. And that is what we intend to do today. Um, uh, I, I want to recognize the chairman of our board, Joe Gildenhorn, Ambassador Joe Gildenhorn, who's in front. Uh, his wife, Alma Gildenhorn, is a member of our council. Uh, Holly Esfandiari is the director of our Middle East program the very capable director of our wonderful Middle East program. And Aaron Miller can defend himself uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, but I, I, as, a, as a point of personal privilege, let me just say a couple of things about uh, one of the panelists and about the topic. Uh, in 1991, I made the decision to run for the United States Congress. It was the first elected office I sought since junior high school treasurer, which I lost. <laughs> and... Um, Someone suggested that I should tour the Middle East, a region I dearly love and visited subsequently 25 times as a member of Congress. Uh, but while in Israel, uh, I was introduced to Ephraim Sneh, who was then, although a highly decorated military person and medical doctor, trying for his first time to run for the Knesset. And so we had lunch in Jaffa, and the symbolism of that should not be lost, the history of Jaffa right at the promontory along the Mediterranean uh, walking distance from downtown Tel Aviv. And we talked about what it was like to run for office. And we were both elected uh, at the same time, and we both left at the same time. And he reminds me that he has a think tank now in Israel, but he isn't paid. His is a voluntary. Um, so I guess that makes him a more, um, um, a better person than I am. Uh, but at any rate, uh, it's interesting how the wheel turns. Uh, today we will address the subject of basically Iran and how uh, those in the region see Iran. And uh, certainly speaking for myself, uh, this is probably um, the uh, most uh, confusing and complicated time in foreign policy in my lifetime. And it's a, su it's a subject I study carefully. Uh, the opportunity for miscalculation and mistake is huge. And uh, the mistakes will be compounded, uh, not just over time, but, but uh, almost immediately, given the amount of social media and attention uh, paid to the region. So it is extremely important that at least we get our facts right. We can then have a different view of what to do, but it is important that we get our facts right. And let me just offer... Uh, one bit of perspective as a uh, former uh, longtime member of uh, the House Intelligence Committee and the House of Representatives Homeland Security Committee, where I studied intelligence closely. Um, intelligence is a prediction. It's not science. And predictions can be wrong. We saw that the intelligence about Iraq's weapons of uh, mass destruction, which many people all over the world believed, not just a few people in the, in the Bush White House. I think that's an unfair hit. Uh, we saw that that intelligence was dreadfully wrong. So when you look at Iran and you try to measure its capabilities and its intentions, think about it as a matrix, uh, 
the information we have, not just we, the Israelis and others who are studying this, uh, is likely to be imperfect. And if you think the intelligence is imperfect, the views of policymakers and policy commentators are probably imperfect too. And so the opportunity for miscalculation is compounded. Um, I just, uh, I think uh, it's important that a panel like this drill down as, 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 as deeply as possible into the views of the different countries in the region and, and very knowledgeable commentators. But again, remember that the opportunity for miscalculation is, is enormous. Uh, I would just close with this. I think that um, as we search for best answers, we have to be mindful, or at least I believe we have to be mindful of what the implications of a nuclear-armed Iran will be, not just for the region, but for the world. Uh, I think they're huge. And I uh, applaud the fact, uh, personally, that our administration and most in our Congress draw a red line uh, ahead of a nuclear-armed Iran. But drawing that red line and then figuring out how to make the red line stick is what, what the hard part is. And so I applaud uh, the effort of uh, the Wilson Center to try to bring you um, a, a, a very good conversation. And I can't think of anybody better than Aaron David Miller, who worked for six administrations so far. I won't out his favorite one, uh, but six, six secretaries of state. I guess it wasn't six administrations, right? He's not that old. <laughs> right. He's not that old. Six secretaries of state so far, and writes and talks so knowledgeably on this issue to introduce our panel. Uh, welcome to all of you, and welcome to our audience and our broader audience. Uh, this is a time when uh, it's important for the public to uh, understand the facts, and it's uh, a, a big honor to head uh, an institute that cares deeply about making sure we present the facts. Thank you very much. Uh, Jane, thank you very much. Uh, you had large shoes to fill in the wake of Lee's departure, but your intelligence, your experience, your style, and your wit uh, has, has really begun to fill them, and it's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to, to be here with you. And to Joe and Alma Gilderhorn, welcome for your, for your generosity in, in su sponsoring and supporting these programs, and welcome to all of you. Uh, today's panel, I'm hopeful, will be as entertaining as it's going to be uh, informative. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was our only PhD president. Uh, there's a reason for that, of course. But Wilson was committed to the notion of breaking down the barriers and the walls that separated the academy from, from government. And he was right, because we need the best of both worlds in order to come up with wise and judicious policies. And I invoke Wilson's spirit here. Today, he may not have been the embodiment of his own uh, fondest hopes, of course, but I invoke Wilson's spirit today because we're going to need his help. Uh, rarely have I seen a region that is roiling with so much uncertainty and so much confusion. Uh, and. Uh, rarely has American influence um, been as constrained uh, in dealing with these problems. Three in particular, and I offer them as a way to, I guess, uh, define and, and highlight some of the challenges that are facing the United States. Number one is the problem of Iran, which has continued to suck all the available oxygen, uh, sometimes rationally, sometimes not, out of the conversation. We have a budding crisis, there's no question about that and no good means to resolve it. Second, the Arab Spring, Arab Winter, Arab Awakening, a once in a century set of changes which are literally transforming the Arab world as we know it, again leaving America unsure, unbalanced, uh, and very uncertain. And finally, the problem, of course, of the much too promised land, what to do about the Israelis and the Palestinians, which over the course of the last several years has offered more process than it has peace and has, I think, shown the triumph, sadly, of experience um, over hope. But these three challenges need to be examined, and that's precisely what uh, our panelists are going to do, do today. They are all long movies. Uh, it doesn't take a profound bit of thinking to make the prediction that they are all going to be playing probably at the end of this year and well into the next administration, regardless of who the President of the United States is. And I'll echo one thing Jane has said. It is now time, I would argue, for cruel and unforgiving analysis. Cruel and unforgiving analysis. We cannot base our policies just on the way the world is, because you must factor in how you want the world to be, 
America is not a potted plant. It does have influence. But at the same time, the risks of only basing your policy on the way you want the world to be, rather than on the way it actually is, is an Rx for catastrophe and disaster, particularly for a great power. And we've seen too much of that when not enough thinking has been replaced by reckless and premature action. I, I don't think there are three better panelists that I could identify to grapple with these issues today. All have had long and deep and rich analytical experience. They're all authors. They've had experience in and around government. And they represent, I think, the best, in my judgment, of this an analytical tradition. Uh, one final point of housekeeping before we begin. They will each speak for 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, I will take the mod moderator's privilege of asking a question or two, and then we will go to your questions. And your questions, I hope, and I, I hope that everyone will identify themselves, but we cannot afford nor do we want what I call station identification. That is to say, questions as questions. And I will try to be cruel and unforgiving in exercising my power, such as it is, um, in um, trying to, to control that discussion and make sure that we, we have enough time for, for questions. Um, uh, Ephraim and Dave uh, and, and, and Trita, each will address any or all of the three issues that I identified. So Ephraim, um, welcome, uh, and let's begin with you. Thank you. In Israel, we always make the distinction between the important and the urgent. Uh, so the most important issue for Israel is <coughs> to reach a final agreement with the Palestinians not because of humanitarian reasons, but because of the fact that this would finally define and shape and protect the character, the democratic and the Jewish character of Israel. That's the most, if we come to the essence of Israel, what Israel is all about, this is the most important. The most urgent is to remove the threat of the Iranian regime. Now, let's see the, the last year, how it affected this, mainly the most important um, uh, issue. What we see in the news is actually how three, four countries in the region are brutally fighting about their, not about their identity, mm -hmm. about to preventing their fragmentation which is Libya, Iraq, Syria, very soon Lebanon, because Syria will spill over to, to Lebanon. But in the broader sense, what we see is that from the border of China to the Atlantic Ocean, the, not all, but most of the countries are dominated or heavily influenced by the ideology of the political Islam, in some cases, the very radical Islam. Since the Cold War, it is the first time when one part of the world in territorial contiguity is dominated by one ideology. Now, the, um, the strongest emerging power of all these changes is that trend in political Islam, which on theological, religious basis denies the existence of a Jewish state in the Middle East and oppose compromise on this issue. And this political power is best or most visibly embodied by the Ahwan, the, the, the Muslim brothers in, in Egypt, but this is only the most famous one. Now, how it may affect uh, the most important issue, the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. The changes, mainly in Egypt, strengthen substantially the Hamas in the Palestinian political arena, and, and it may bring about a situation that in a year from now, it will be more difficult for Abbas and the current 
uh, Palestinian leadership, which is the best partner Israel could ever have to, to maintain their current position, especially if Hamas will, will have that strong endorsement and, and backing that they enjoy today. The, the, the readiness and the ability of the Palestinian leadership to, to be forthcoming or even to maintain its current position may be in danger. What may happen? Why it's important? Because a year from now, two, two conditions which do not exist today may exist. One is another Israeli government which is committed to reach agreement, and today it's not the case, and an American president who is not constrained by whatever uh, he has to, uh, to take under consideration in an election year. An American president which, which will be able at the beginning of 2013, if not to knock heads, to bring the two parties to march the extra inch, and here I quote your book, the inch that on their own will, the two parties will, ne will, will, will never march. He may bring them to do it. So in the, at the beginning of the next year, there, there is a possibility of, of new situation where Israeli-Palestinian agreement can be achievable if till then the current uh, Palestinian leadership uh, will, uh, will, will survive. There is, if we have to look for an anecdote to better understand the situation, you, Aaron, for sure remembers, and many in the audience, the scene on the podium on the, in Egypt when the Oslo B agreement was about to be signed and in the, in, and Arafat, for some bizarre reason, say, I am not signing, and everybody was on the podium, Kozirov and the st Secretary of State, all, uh, uh, all the uh, regional and the international leaders, uh, Arafat standing the side, refusing to, su to sign, and then uh, President Mubarak came to him and strongly, loudly whispered on his ear, Imdi Akelb Imdi, which means sign, ya, dog, sign. <laughs> Today, no one will say it to any leader to sign. Mubarak is in the cage, unfortunately. Now, about the most urgent thing, and this is Iran. Here I prefer in the few, few minutes I have to make few comments in the clearest way that I can. The first one, no one in Israel is a trigger happy about Iran. No one. <coughs> we all know the repercussions. We all know the unavoidable uh, price for a military strike. But all of us, or almost all of us, believe that in a certain situation, this price is worth paying or that we don't have another choice. And why? And here is the second, the second comment. There is no government in Jerusalem which, will, which uh, may accept nuclear Iran not only because of the philosophic argument that when a regime is committed to the destruction of Israel, we can't allow him to have the tools to do it, but because we have to think one step far farther beyond the immediate horizon. F from the moment that Iran has a nuclear bomb, it's a matter of several years, no more than that, that Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Turkey will have a bomb of their own. In those three countries, what we have is, I would say, conditions which are in a way, not precisely, similar to Pakistan. A very strong Islamist influence 
an unknown mechanism of how this, this uh, nuclear weapon is, is, is controlled. So Israel, my children, my grandchildren, will have to live in, an, in a region where we have one Iran and three Pakistan. No government in Jerusalem has the right to leave this reality for our children. Never. It's a strategic and even a personal nightmare. And not my, my third comment is, the real problem is not the nuclear project. The problem is the regime. The subversion against moderate regime in the region. Let alone this, this, the, the oppression at home. The deployment of dozens of thousands of rockets and, mis uh, and missiles around Israel, in Gaza, and more so in, in, in Lebanon. There is no other country which is so domestically cruel and cruel at home and brutal and aggressive outside. Who today, which country today, after the Cold War, deploys thousands of missiles targeted at civilian population. The only country in the world where almost most of the population can tomorrow, tomorrow night go and to live in, in shelters, and part of them already did so, is Israel. And who behind it? The regime in Tehran, with, uh, without the nuclear weapon. So the pr what, and I speak about the Israeli perspective, though it's not our, only our pr problem, but the problem is the regime with imperial ambition and with no real inhibitions. And this regime must be toppled. And, and it happened so that the Iranian people want this regime to be changed. Not by external force, not by uh, military action of some uh, external power, but by its own will. They want to live freely. So, what, this, and this is my, 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 la my last comment in the 11th minute. <coughs> what should be done? As, as I say, military option is the really very last resort. But what can be done? Real acceleration of the sanctions by imposing them, not just signing legislation in the Capitol Hill or in the White House, to impose the sanctions, to punish the international Chinese, Russian companies which defy the U.S. legislation, to stop courting the regime, to stop toying with this naive illusion of engagement, what is an engagement? Engagement is a give and take. The give, at whose expense will it be? Israel, the Iranian people, the Gulf country, and um, the last humble recommendation, although I advise all those who deli de deliberate and speculate what Israel can do and can't do, please assume that there is no operational problem that we don't find operational solution to. That's all. <laughs> Ephraim, thank you very much. You've sharpened the arguments and, and, uh, and the issues, and we really appreciate that. Nate? Thank you. Um, uh, as a lawyer, I feel a professional compulsion to start with a caveat, so here it is. Um, we are talking about a changing fluid situation. We're talking about a situation that no one can predict. We can present a snapshot, which I'll try to uh, present, but we should approach recommendations and what have you with a great deal of humility. Um, with that said, I would start by saying that the Arab world and Iran are not natural allies. On paper, you see many points of tension between the two. 
the Persian versus the Arab. This is a tension that uh, is latent, but we see it emerging every now and then, uh, whether with the Arab minority in Iran, whether, uh, so it is something that is there in the Arab psyche and I assume in the Iranian psyche. Equally, the tension between uh, Shia and Sunni. This is a tension that keeps on arising and I would say that, ironically or not, the more that you have an ascendance of the Sunni Islamist movements in the Arab world, the more that this tension is sharpened. If you're a secular, the issue of religion doesn't matter. If you define yourself uh, mainly as a Sunni Muslim movement, then dealing with the Shia infidels obviously becomes uh, a major issue and a vulnerability. And finally, there's also the issue of uh, geopolitical aspirations, the issue of dom dominance. Who's going to be the hegemon in the area? We see these playing, I mean, best uh, exemplified uh, through the issue of the three islands in what everyone calls the Persian Gulf, or what I was uh, brought up to be uh, to know as the Arab Gulf. So uh, these issues continue to uh, define at least aspects of the relation. And these are issue positions, by the way, that transcend which regime governs Iran. These were issues that were uh, relevant when the Shah was governing Iran, and they continue to be relevant today. And it's no surprise in this context that in many Arab uh, regimes and Arab governments, uh, at least at the leadership level, they're more worried about a nuclear Iran than they are about the nuclear Israel. At the end of the day, there's a sense that Israel's ability to be the hegemon and to influence uh, re Arab politics is limited for many reasons. Iran is not. And so an Iran with nuclear weapons today is a bigger problem for, gov for Arab uh, governments than uh, nuclear Israel. I'm not only talking about the Gulf, by the way. This is true in Jordan, this is true in, in Egypt uh, and elsewhere. Iran, however, sought to uh, replace this problematic narrative, these points of tension, with a super narrative, with another narrative that uh, allows them access at least to the Arab street and to Arab public opinion and ability to influence. And that is the narrative of uh, resistance versus accommodation. Through uh, cultivating an access that includes Iran, uh, Syria, Hezbollah and the Islamist Palestinian organizations, uh, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and even flirtation with Fatah, they, cre they uh, managed to or try to present a different narrative. This is an axis, resistance versus accommodation, uh, resistance for uh, the resistors versus the traitors. And this is a narrative that had good traction. As long as the uh, anti-Israel, anti-Arab, I mean anti-US, uh, pro-Palestinian narrative defined the Arab public discourse. And that was the case for a very long time. If you watch Jazeera, Al Arabiya, what have you, a Palestinian story is always, if not the headline, the top uh, news item, it's in the first page. Um, this, however, this uh, narrative suffered tremendously with the advent of the Arab Spring, awakening, troubles, call it what you will. These narratives, the pro-Palestinian, etc., anti-Israeli, anti-US, are no longer the main narratives in the Arab Spring. They're not dead, they are there, simmering, and at some point I would assume that they will come back to the forefront, but for the time being, they are not what defines the Arab uh, uh, discourse. Again, look at the pan-Arab media, look at Jazeera, Arabia, you will see that Palestinian issues rarely uh, emerge. It's what's happening in Syria, it's what's happening uh, elsewhere. Um, equally, the Arab Spring came back to expose some of these tensions that uh, were latent over the last period. Um, for example, Iran's uh, characterization of the Arab uh, Spring as Islamic Spring or Islamic Awakening simply did not correspond to the sentiment in the street. These Arab uh, movements, even though uh, many we see are being now co-opted by the Islamist movements, were not initiated by the Islamist movement and they were not Islamists in their nature. So there was a degree of uh, disconnect between the Iranian messaging and the Arab street that made the messaging uh, more difficult to, uh, uh, to receive and to take hold. This was compounded by, the, by Iran's sectarian response to this uh, Arab spring. The response to, Iran, uh, to what's happening in Bahrain, which in Iranian uh, language was blown out of proportion to what uh, was going on, compared to the response, say, regarding Syria. And Syria in particular, I would say, is the point that has, 
I would say, made Iran, in terms of public opinion, the biggest loser in the uh, Arab Spring, by supporting Ira uh, Syria, whose uh, repression is seen every day on TV screens. What we see in Arabic uh, media is even more graphic than we see uh, here, and much more disturbing, <coughs> especially for the Arab uh, street, the fact that this Alawite regime, backed by those Shia Iranians, is killing Sunni uh, citizens. All of this basically, in my view, reduced Iran's influence and ability to influence and affect uh, the Arab street and the Arab public opinion. In the Palestinian uh, case, this was particularly felt and particularly uh, if, uh, effective in terms of uh, where Hamas is going and how Hamas is managing this uh, situation. As you know, Palestinian politics has been defined over the last few years by uh, the Hamas Fatah faction. Hamas traditionally has been closely allied to uh, Iran. And this alliance was uh, made possible through the rhetoric of uh, resistance and rejection. But it was never a comfortable alliance. And there were moments where this uh, alliance reached points of tension that were threatening to Hamas. For example, when Saddam Hussein was executed. In Gaza, in the streets of Gaza, we started seeing graffiti that called uh, Hamas a Shia organization, which Hamas felt very vulnerable to. But by and large, they managed to uh, maintain the relationship specifically through uh, the lens of Syria. In this regard, Syria really worked as a support laundering operation. Money and support comes from uh, Iran to our Arab brothers in Syria, transferred to Hamas. The money becomes cleaner as you receive it. The support becomes cleaner as you receive it. This conduit no longer exists. This uh, filter no longer exists. And Hamas finds itself facing uh, an unpopular alliance. Add to this that it came with operational cost as well, withholding the support for, uh, to uh, Syria. And basically, Iran is not pumping as much money into uh, Hamas. It can't, for many reasons, including its lack of support for uh, Syria. This has fought Hamas, especially in the diaspora, which tended to be traditionally the, where the center of gravity for power in Hamas. It forced Hamas to start looking for another home, another patron. And this, in many ways, uh, explains what we see today, the movement of Khalid Mish'al and his uh, trip to Doha and uh, the letter the, uh, or the agreement he signed with Abbas and all of these things. They are looking to try to find another pattern, and this comes with a price. The Muslim Brotherhood in uh, Egypt, the Jordanians, the uh, Qataris, will not host Hamas as long as Hamas is uh, involved in terrorism and some of these actions because they do not want this to define what's going to be a very complex relation with the West. They don't want this issue to be the defining issue. Forces Hamas then to make tough decisions, at least the diaspora Hamas. This tension though, even though relations uh, with Iran are a liability to some extent, it is still in many ways remains an asset. And this explains why Hamas now is part, or Iran is part of the internal struggle within Hamas. Mish'al goes to Doha to sign the agreement with Abbas. Haniya, the Prime Minister of Hamas in Gaza, goes to Tehran to send the message that we still have options in the region. But by and large, we see a tension, and we see that at least the arc of events, the trajectory of events, is forcing Hamas and others to uh, be more, uh, to find a place in the axis that they used to be less amenable to. The Arab Spring, as I said, weakened Ham uh, Iran's influence and ability and Hamas's message uh, receivability in the Arab Spring. This has not changed uh, Iran's uh, military capabilities or its military options or any of these uh, issues, but it has allowed some of the Arab leaders to counter Hamas, uh, Iran's influence in a more aggressive way with a more forgiving public opinion. Talking about finding a silver lining in this uh, cloud, I would say right now Hamas's influence is reduced and it's easier, at least from a counter-terrorism and intelligence point of view, to counter some of Hamas's uh, effects in the region. And I'll go back to where I started. I will conclude with this. This is a snapshot and this is a very flu fluid situation. If things remain the way they are today, yes, Ham Iran's influence is reduced and we have a better way of managing uh, the Iran, at least ideological and terror-oriented uh, hegemony. However, there are many things that uh, could change this outcome. What happens in Syria is essential. If the Assad regime survives, 
then we will see a possibility of a resurgence of this uh, Iranian capability to influence. Equally, the direction of the Arab Spring, where it's going, who's going to be in charge at the end of the day, uh, is the anti-American, anti-Israel uh, rhetoric going to become, in a year's time, too appealing to uh, reject for some of these organizations? How we in the United States approach these uh, new Arab uh, governments and to what extent do we make a relation with us more attractive than a relation with Iran? And by the way, this is a point here that Iran has always been much more flexible in its ability to support its friends in the region. After the Lebanon war, the last one, as we were humming and howling and how we're going to support or whether we should support uh, reconstruction in Lebanon, the Iranians were pumping money. To the extent that we can uh, be more agile and flexible in supporting some of the friends that we like, uh, this will affect the outcome. And finally, of course, what's going to happen regarding Iran's nuclear uh, program. And both scenarios uh, present a noble and potentially dangerous uh, trends. An attack on Iran, whether by Israel or by the United States, could go one way and would uh, potentially create uh, a resurgence of sympathy to Iran. On the other hand, uh, a nuclear Iran will also uh, affect the balance of power and, as you said, could uh, start a nuclear race. Um, but I will conclude on a positive note and, see and say until we see these things and until these changes happen, and they will not happen in a day or two, we have an opportunity right now to start countering some of the influence, to start some bringing some of the organizations that have been closer to Iran to a place that we feel more comfortable with. Um, I don't believe that we should do this at any price. As we approach uh, Hamas, for example, which I believe is, in some components of it, ready to move, we should not, in my view, compromise on our positions. And keep in mind that we are, at this moment, at a moment of strength, and they need us uh, in this period. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Okay, thank you very much for those um, perceptive observations. Um, Chita. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure being here, and I just want to echo what uh, Congresswoman Harmon said in the opening, that Woodrow Wilson truly is uh, quite amazing in creating that political space for conversations that you rarely find anywhere else. And I uh, feel very privileged to be on this panel to partake in that conversation. I'm going to address two key issues that already have been touched upon. One is Iran and the Arab world in the aftermath of these recent uprisings, and the second one is this very interesting U.S.-Israel-Iran triangle. Uh, to preface it, when you have significant changes, transformation, uh, as was mentioned earlier, taking place in the region, it forces all actors to take into account that there's new moving parts. They have to put them into the new equations, figure out how they fit and how they don't fit. And they have to reassess and recalibrate their perspectives and their interests vis-a-vis -vis not only their enemies but also vis-a-vis -vis their friends. Uh, that's a natural process. It's now taking place in the way that the Iranians are dealing, in my view, quite unsuccessfully uh, with the Arab world. But it's also something that is very interesting to analyze on how the perspectives, the diverging perspectives between the United States and Israel is taking place on the issue of Iran. And I'll get back to that later. On the first issue of Iran and the Arab world, I think uh, it was quite correct the way it was put that Iran's basis for soft power in the region has taken a significant hit. It's taken a significant hit because of the way that these Arab uprisings have developed. The Iranians originally <coughs> welcomed it. In fact, they had hoped for it to happen, but they thought that it would take place with uh, a very strong anti-American component within it. And so far, we have not seen that. And I think it's quite interesting to see that even though currently now what is happening in Syria and the massacres that are taking place there and as Gate put it, it's very viv visibly viewed on Arab TVs. That has caused a huge loss for the Iranian influence and, and their uh, soft power in Iran in a manner that, unfortunately, the Iranian government's own repression of its own people in 2009 did not. The polls in the Arab world after the 2009 elections show that <coughs> during that time in which that super narrative was still centered on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, uh, and still centered on uh, the perspective of the U.S. being too heavy-handed in the region. In that context, the Arab public opinion was not particularly affected by the way that the Iranian government was mistreating its own people. Now, however, with, in the context of a new narrative, you see that uh, whether it is the sectarian dimension or just what's plainly is taking place in Syria is having 
uh, uh, quite a negative effect for the Iranians. The Iranians, however, seem to be counting on playing the long game in this, uh, counting on the fact that we have seen in the region in the past periods in which Arab regimes have uh, embarked on extensive repressions of their own populations. But once that is over, the natural gravitation of the region has been to go back to the narrative in which the Israeli-Palestinian issue is at the center. And that is something that the Iranian government very early since 1979 have tried to perpetuate because it is through the Palestinian issue, it's through political Islam that the Iranian government has sought to bridge the Arab-Sunni, the, the Arab-Persian divide as well as the Sunni-Shia divide in order to present Iran as a potent candidate for regional leadership, which, as others put it, uh, is viewed on the other side as Iranian hegemonic aspirations. Uh, whether that will happen or not remains to be seen, but I think it puts some urgency on the issue that Ephraim was mentioning earlier on, that as long as the Israeli-Palestinian issue remains unresolved, as long as it remains a, a, a bleeding wound in the region, there will always be opportunities to bring the narrative in the region back to that, uh, and we will return to a, a scenario much more similar to what existed before the Arab uprising. On the second issue, though, and I'll spend a little bit more time on that, uh, is the natural divergence and convergence that constantly happens between even allies, such as the United States and Israel, when it comes to the issue of Iran. I think it's been quite interesting to take a look at how Israel, the United States and Israel have had very close perspectives uh, on Iran for quite some time, but there's been interesting fluctuations, and there's been at times in which they have been quite at odds with each other. I would say that since the Arab uprising, the divergence between the United States' perspective and Israel's perspective on a whole set of issues uh, in the region have actually been quite uh, interesting to observe. First of all, with Obama coming into power, uh, embarking on diplomacy, as was described as naive uh, from the Israeli perspective, uh, putting the Israeli-Palestinian issue back a little bit more in the center compared to what the Bush administration did, and then the Obama administration's reaction and handling of the Arab Spring are three issues in which the Israeli and the American perspective have been quite divergent on. On the issue of Iran itself, it's been quite clear. 24 hours after President Obama won the elections in November 2008, then Foreign Minister Sipli Livni was asked by Israeli radio of what she thought of it and what she thought of the idea of the United States and Iran engaging in diplomacy. She answered that in this region, uh, there is a tendency, there is a reality in which talking to your enemies can be seen as a sign of weakness. She was asked in a follow-up question whether Israel supports uh, Obama's idea of engagement with Iran, and she said no, categorically, period. No explanation. Once the Netanyahu government came into power, however, this became even more acute uh, in the sense that from the Israeli perspective, uh, the key divergent point is what to do with the issue of enrichment in Iran. The Israeli fear is that if there is a successful negotiation, the most likely outcome of a successful negotiation is that there would be some limited level of enrichment left on Iranian soil, obviously under very, very strict inspections. But that in and of itself, the Israeli fear is, would permit Iran to become a virtual nuclear power, which would shift the balance in the region would have many of the negative repercussions that the Israelis fear would exist if Iran had the actual bomb. The differentiation between these two scenarios is far less in the Israeli perspective than it is in the American perspective. The Bush administration adopted a, a red line of zero enrichment, which was essentially identical to that of the current Israeli government. Obama has kept this issue quite vague and ambiguous. There's actually no statement from President Obama till this day in which he clarifies what his position is on the issue of enrichment, which is a central point in the negotiations. There's no statement that enrichment is unacceptable, nor is there a statement that enrichment would be acceptable. Now, this has fueled fears on all sides. On the Israeli side, there is the fear that this ambiguity is masking an American desire to accept enrichment on Iranian soil at the end of the negotiations. On the Iranian side, interestingly enough, the fear is that this ambiguity is there to mask an American desire not to accept any enrichment at the end of the day. 
but that the U.S. needs to adopt this position now in order to even get negotiations started because the Iranians wouldn't even come to the table if it was clear that the American position is not to accept any enrichment at the end of the negotiation. And there's been several examples during this last three years in which Obama at least periodically tried engagement in which the Israeli governments uh, under Netanyahu's position was quite clearly to try to make that more difficult, whether it was to push for a deadline of only 12 weeks for diplomacy, uh, which is interesting, 20 years of sanctions uh, didn't work, but diplomacy needs to miraculously resolve this issue in 12 weeks, or whether it was to push for sanctions to be imposed before negotiations began, something that the Obama administration vehemently opposed because they tried to create an atmosphere that would be more conducive to the success of talks, or whether it was the idea of Obama not talking about all options being on the table, not taking any options off the table, but the Obama administration in the early days of its engagement tactic wanted to pursue demilitarization of the narrative, of the atmosphere, of the discourse in order to get the Iranian guards down in order to be able to begin uh, some proper negotiations. Israeli response was to do exactly the opposite, fearing that if there isn't a clear military option on the table, there wouldn't be any impetus for the Iranians to compromise. And here again you see a divergence of how they view it. And these divergences may not be radical, they may not even be strategic, but at the tactical level they have been quite problematic. And we see that playing out today when there is an even higher pitch when it comes to the debate of whether uh, Israel will strike Iran, what, what the U.S. thinks about it. And I think it's, it's reached a certain level particularly because it's also gotten itself woven into the American election campaign. What we have seen just in the last couple of weeks is how after the Obama administration in the late summer of 2010 adopted uh, an assumption that was very much supported by Israel, which read that the only time the Iranians have successfully agreed to uh, compromise on their nuclear program has been when they have been faced with an imminent and credible military threat. That was in 2003, the analysis reads, when the Iranians suspended their enrichment right after uh, the United States successfully had knocked out Iraq. The idea then has been to ratchet up sanctions as well as do military signalings to recreate the impression that such a military threat does exist. And as a result, force the Iranian leadership to make decisions to face the options that they, according to this analysis, have tried to evade for so long. The danger, of course, in this is that it creates a very explosive situation. The slightest spark can get a war that I don't believe the Obama administration wants to have, but it wants to give the impression that it could have. Uh, and in that, these tactical differences between Israel and the United States have become quite problematic. And you could see it, for instance, when there was this latest assassination of a rather unimportant person within the Iranian nuclear program on January 3rd. For the first time, the United States quickly and in person had Secretary Clinton go to the podium, categorically deny any American involvement in this assassination, and then condemning it as well. Prior to that, during the Bush administration, there was no condemnation of terrorist acts against uh, uh, Iran. And then later on, during the Obama administration, there were statements issued, but never the Secretary of State going to the podium and doing so in person. I think that was very deliberate because the administration is in a phase in which it wants to de-escalate. It wanted to ratchet things up in order to get maximum leverage for a negotiation, but it did not want things to spill over into an open conflict. And there again, the tactical differences between Israel and the United States are playing a quite a uh, decisive role in this. Just one last point on this, just to give you an impression of how tense these tactical differences have become. You had a couple, two weeks ago, NBC report that three American uh, U.S. administration officials confirmed um, or gave their assessment that Israel is behind these assassinations and it is doing so in collaboration with an Iranian terrorist organization called the Mujahideen Akhal, which is on the U.S.'s terrorist list. Um, this was quite explosive because um, uh, it's, it's pointing a finger at an ally. And then you have these trips by Dempsey back and forth and we saw the comments yesterday from Israel saying that this open conversation about these differences is ultimately serving the interest of the Iranian government. Now, what are the solutions to be found in this? I, I'm not gonna even try to give you a solution in, uh, within 12 minutes. 
But let me just point out that I think one of the positives that currently do exist here is I think the administration is quite clear on not wanting a military confrontation. We're not in a situation similar to what existed a couple of years ago in which there were strong factions within the administration that actually favored it and, and were happy to see it develop in that direction. You have a situation now in which there is a deliberate strategy to try to force things to a climax in order to get decisions to be made. But there is no desire, at least not that I have been able to detect in Washington, within the administration, for a military confrontation. I'll stop there. Thank you. Trina, thank you very much. Uh, let me make just a few observations and then go directly to questions. Number one, I, I think it's quite clear that um, you're dealing with a situation in which there will be no solutions, no concrete determinative solutions to at least the three problems that we've identified. Um, there's no diplomatic breakthrough in the offing between the U.S. and Iran. And I'll get back to this in a minute. There may not be uh, a direct military confrontation coming either. So we, are en we end up here in a variant of what uh, the cartoon. It's a s serious business, but it's the Tom and Jerry game, the cat and the mouse, over the next six months trying to avoid the worst of both possible outcomes. And here, covert war plus sanctions, however escalatory it may be, is a better option than the alternative, which is overt war. Uh, number two. None of these problems, Arab Spring, Arab Awakening, the Arab-Israeli issue, or Iran's nuclear aspirations are amenable, in my judgment, to what I would call conventional solutions. The conventional transactional diplomacy and the projection of American military power that, we, that have co has come to characterize our diplomacy may not be well suited to even producing a more constructive outcome. Forget a solution, a more constructive outcome. But the problem is the transformational approach, the bold and decisive initiatives are also extremely problematic, which brings me to my second point. You have a president who came to Washington wanting to transform both the domestic political environment and alter the trajectory of American foreign policy, but he has ended up, and I'm not being critical here, as a tr much more as a transactor. In fact, you could make an argument without being um, too critical that he has evolved into a much less ideological, much less reckless, much more disciplined version of his predecessor in the last several years of his predecessor's administration. Surge in Afghanistan, uh, very tough policies on national security with predator drones, Guantanamo, uh, tougher sanctions on Iran, and great caution on the Arab-Israeli issue. So you don't have a transformational approach. You don't have a Nixon to China. You don't have an administration that's going to ask three basic questions. What do we want from Iran? What does Iran want from us? And how do we both get what we want? Those three questions were critical to the kinds of transformational diplomacy <coughs> that preceded the Kissinger-Nixon gambit to China and to detente. Those questions may be asked, but is there a way to actually operationalize them? Is there a breakthrough strategy when it comes to diplomacy uh, with Iran? Uh, finally, uh, I'll point out the obvious. We, as a country, have entered a period of terra incognita when it comes to the Arab world. Uh, in, in a matter of a year, we have seen both our friends and our enemies literally go the way of the dodo. The Arab world for us now is, is a new experience. It was basically divided into two types of authoritarians. There were the acquiescent authoritarians, the Egyptians, the Tunisians, and then there were the adversarial authoritarians. The Iraqis played both roles, the Syrians and the Libyans. They're all gone. Our friends are gone, and so are our traditional enemies with whom we have actually found a way to uh, more or less coexist. So we, we are in a new experience. And the Arab world, preoccupied as it is, may well offer up an opportunity for the non-Arabs to play a much greater role. Three countries, frankly, right now, uh, are in pos are a position to be much more consequential to the future of this region than any single Arab country. Israel, 
Iran, and Turkey. Those three countries are still capable of acting, and I'm not suggesting always for the good, in ways that can change the nature of conflict or peacemaking in this region. Just a set of observations. Uh, now, I have the moderator's prerogative. So I'm going to ask each of you the question that I presume is on the minds of everyone in this room and most of official and unofficial Washington. But I want to do it in a very provocative manner. So here's the question. By the end of this calendar year, will Iran's nuclear sites, by the end of this calendar year, will Iran's nuclear sites be struck in military action? I would like a and I'm going to be very hard on this one. I want a yes or no from each of you initially, and I want a one, and if the answer is no, I want a one sentence, maybe two sentence explanation as to why. Will Israel or the United States strike Iran's nuclear sites by the end of this calendar year? And if not, very briefly, why not? And I would gladly give you my view after you give me yours. <laughs> so, Tr Trida, why don't we begin with you? Yes or no? No. Uh, I think the risk for a military confrontation is higher than it has been in the past. Um, but let's not forget, we've been, we've been seeing this movie about five times now, just in the last decade of <coughs> Israel just being about to do it and then not doing it. But I do think that it is higher than before, but probably still less than 15%. If, however, there is another round of talks and they fail, then I would change my prediction. But by the end of the calendar year, you and I will be having, or all of us will be having more or less a version of the same conversation. There will, be, there will be no unilateral military strike against Iran's nuclear sites. From the Israeli side? Yes, okay. Dave? I'll take the easy way out and say yes. Uh, <laughs> it's safer to say yes. That's the easy way out. I don't have to explain it. Uh, explain. I, I see an escalation of rhetoric, and I see all the players basically pushing themselves further and further to a corner, and all it takes is a little spark. And I just don't see with all of this uncertainty how these unpredictable little sparks can be uh, stopped. Ephraim. And by the way, you are moderator or interrogator? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of both, actually. Uh, my answer is no. Because I believe that at a certain point, it will be clear in this, in this town that the danger of an Israeli strike of are bigger than to take a serious economic action against, uh, against Iran. So we have two no's and one yes. And I will then add my answer, which is no. It's possible, but not probable for one simple reason. For Israel, this is not a discretionary war at the moment, but for most of the world, including the United States right now, it is. And the basis for a discretionary war, which carries this kinds of, these kinds of consequences against the returns of what could actually be achieved, the balance is simply not compelling. So I will say no, no strike between now and the end of the calendar year. Now, one final question. This has been an, a very uplifting session filled with all kinds of hopes and aspirations for this very troubled region. So I'd like to ask each of you, is there any good news? A single piece of significant consequential good news that you can identify for us? Uh, Rafe, why don't we start with you? I think I presented my piece of good news. As the way I, I see it, when you have a transformation, when you have a fluid situation, yes, it's full of danger, we're full of risks and unknowns, but also it's full of opportunities. We're not the only ones who are not clear about what's going on. All the players are in a uh, situation of tension. And that's the time to start really engaging with a way of, say, of uh, playing on these insecurities. <coughs> and uh, some of the things that we were thought impossible in the past, uh, limiting Iran's uh, soft power, limiting Iran's influence on some of this, uh, its players, uh, are now open. The question for us is, uh, as we look at this, do we take a very conservative uh, view and just do a minimal situation? Or are we going to be more of risk takers 
and take the kind of bold uh, moves that will allow us to have more influence. If we sit and do nothing, it's clear it's uh, spinning out of our control. There are things that we can do that, of course, we don't own the issue, we are not the main influencer, but we can do a lot in order to put our interest in a stronger uh, position once the dust has settled. Judah? You, you challenged us on this issue, which is really unfair, asking people who follow the Middle East to point <laughs> to some good news. That's really not <laughs> what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, but if, if I were to say something, I would say, again, what I said earlier on, I think there is far greater realization in the administration and levels of constraint than, than, than existed before. I do also believe that by 2013, there will be more political space to take more courageous action. The question is, can conflict management be uh, successfully pursued in 2012, making sure that nothing further deteriorates in order to get out of the political season that we're in right now, in order to have the, uh, at least a little bit more boldness and political space to address the issues in 2013. But if I could pick a fight um, uh, with my fellow panelists, I would say, I think one of the frame, there's two frames that I think have been dominating the conversation, a little bit here but also generally in, in, in town, is that the options are between bombing Iran and having an Iranian bomb. I think there are far, far more options on the table and we should have a discourse that gives space for that because uh, we're not at a point in which such uh, negative options are the only ones remaining on the table. The other one is as we analyze and correctly point out that Iran's influence is reduced in the region, we also do the opposite of again pu putting Iran as if it is the most important factor in the region. Um, saying that if we can get Hamas out of Iran, I'm not saying it wouldn't be a bad or a good thing, but it's not as if these problems didn't exist before Iran was involved in it. Iran is not that central. We're permitting this, uh, this entity to gain far more influence and role uh, than it deserves, even when we also correctly point out that its soft power is reducing. I think in some ways it's become an, an ability for us to escape the, the inevitable responsibility of addressing the real problems because it's always so much easier to just to point to one or two actors and, and put, not necessarily the blame there, but to put the onus of the analysis there. Ibrahim, good news? Uh, if you look plainly in the picture, no good news, only bad news. But <laughs> in our region, we can't have the privilege of being pessimistic. So I will point few few sources of hope. The first one is that the Iranian people didn't say its last word. And I do believe that, again, if without mistake on the American slash European side, I believe a revolutionary situation can be created in Iran. It's possible. It's almost unavoidable. The question is when, not if. And this is something which I uh, strongly believe can change the regional picture. This is one thing. The second, I, I believe there is another people, which is my people, which I believe uh, in the next year will choose a more reasonable government. The third one, the third one. You have three optimistic points? That's uh, almost unfair. Uh, no, I, <laughs> When you will hear the fourth one, you will <laughs> I'm not sure you will agree with me. Now, uh, I still believe that the, Palest the Palestinian leadership, pragmatism will be strong enough to, to confront and to overcome <coughs> the trend of radicalism in the region. And I know the persons, I know the people from your leadership, and I and I believe in, in, their, in their wisdom. And if everything fails, uh, I, I have uh, to say that we still are the strongest military power between the Caspian Sea and the Atlantic. And this is my fourth source of optimism and uh, even the sine qua non for my optimism. Thank you. These thoughts you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Fran. My, my own answer to my own question is things could be a lot worse. <laughs> So let's go, let's go to your, uh, your questions. Please identify yourself. Yes, wait, wait for the mic, please. Thank you. Thank you, I'm Benjamin Tour, a former US government employee. Uh, Mr. Sney, uh, 
you put a lot of emphasis in your remarks on the Islamic dimension uh, in the region, and uh, you spoke about an ideology of Islam, a term that's normally uh, used in connection with political systems or movements such as communism. Uh, could you elaborate, and using the same terms, could you uh, refer to an ideology of Christianity? Can you explain it better, the last point? Well, uh, you say Islam has an ideology. Uh, does another one of the great uh, monotheistic religions, Christianity, which also represents over a billion people, also have an ideology, and uh, which could be more or less dangerous or neutral? I don't think that there is a com uh, comparison here, uh, because today there is no a overlap between religious Christianity and political ambition. The problem is that there is, in our region and in the broader region, the fact that a religion is translated to a political and imperial ambition. That's the point, and not only by Iran. That's the change. When Imperial am ambition, it's, it's natural in international relations, but when it is motivated by a religion, it gives it, a, I would say, a more reckless and, and relentless and brutal style. And whenever you zip in the television, you watch it. You can't watch television without seeing how the combination of religion, politics, imperial ambition is transformed to un unimaginable brutality. Barbara. Uh, Barbara Slavin from the Atlantic Council. Um, thank you for an interesting discussion. Uh, this is for former uh, Minister Snay. Um, when Israel looks at the downsides of an attack on uh, the Iranian nuclear program, do you consider the casualties that it would cause within Iran in terms of bombing sites that are full of radioactive and other toxic materials? Uh, has Israel ever done any kind of study that would look at the numbers of people who would be killed and injured in Iran if it were to mount such a strike? Is that even a, a factor in Israel's calculations? Thanks. I have uh, to be very careful in answering your questions because you are on the on the gray line between ethical question and operational question. But uh, I can guarantee, I can assure you that Israel is very very um, careful to avoid that kind of damage. Here you cross the border between moral issue and operational discussion, which I'm not allowed to enter. I, you know, I have so many wonderful answers to give you, but I can't. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, in the third row here. As a follow-up to that question, obviously there has been a tremendous amount of uh, analogy and analysis of what would happen with a nuclear Iran to the Arab countries along the Persian Gulf, Western Europe, and also maybe eventually the United States through Venezuela. How do you deal with those realities of a nuclear Iran? You ask me? Yes, sir, or, or this other gentleman too, either one. Maybe Dr. Parsley will. You're, sorry, could you clarify that question? I, I think the main thing is we talk about the, the of it by Israel the United States on Iran, but also I think people are forgetting the serious reality of a nuclear Iran. I know the Sunni countries along the Persian Gulf are extremely concerned, as well as the United States assets in the region with the nuclear Iran, with Iran. we have in place in Iran. I don't think there are any elements that necessarily would view a nuclear-armed Iran as a positive. 
On the contrary, I think it's, it's an end endless list of negatives that would come around if you had a further spread of nuclear weapons in the region. But we have to take a step back here because that's actually not what we're discussing. We're not discussing whether Iran should or shouldn't have nuclear weapons. What the negotiations are being focused on is whether there should be any enrichment in Iran and under what circumstances. We are taking this issue to a far higher level of hysteria that it doesn't deserve to be at right now. The Iranians have a very impressive and mighty arsenal of zero nuclear weapons right now. That is not to say that we shouldn't be careful and that we shouldn't be very uh, prudent and trying to look at every option. But what we're not talking about is weapons. What we're talking about actually either containment or hitting uh, a nuclear capability. Now, in the analysis of some states, the nuclear capability is essentially equivalent of a nuclear weapon. In the analysis of the vast majority of states, that is not the case. And that's where you have some of these differences in analysis and perspectives here. I believe that at the end of the day, if we permit ourselves to view some of these nuances, we increase our own decision-making space. We can find ways to resolve this issue instead of forcing ourselves into a fabricated choice of thinking that we either have to bomb or accept the bomb. We're not there, and we shouldn't be there. Well, we're not, we're not there yet, you say, but we'll be there qu very quickly if we rush towards that type of a framing. We don't have to. We can take a step back and take a look at the nuances and open up this issue and see the many options that actually do exist. L let me just offer a brief comment because this is an important point. I mean, because it, it cuts to the core of the motivational character of the regime. Why would a regime want nuclear weapons? And while history is not a, uh, uh, a, a great guide here, it, it, it rhymes rather than repeats, outside of the five permanent members of the Security Council that all have nuclear weapons, only four countries possess them deliverable nuclear devices. Four, North Korea, India, Pakistan, and Israel. Now, I would argue to you, these are, these are countries, three for sure, the Israelis don't quite fit the model, but to some degree, maybe. They, they marry profound insecurity, profound insecurity, with an element of grandiosity. That is to say, they are entitled and fundamentally insecure at the same time which I would argue is the worst conceivable marriage when it comes to individuals and, and in the lives of nations. And you know, sitting in Tehran, if in fact you argued, and, and they heard Ephraim, who argued that we must change the regime, then the best hedge against that would in fact be the possession of, of a weapon, which raises the costs of regime change, and also increases your own capacity to realize your regional ambitions. So it's circumstantial, but I find it, frankly, very compelling. And the North Koreans wanted a bomb. We couldn't stop them. The Indians, the Pakistanis, the Israelis were the first to develop. All of them ended up with a deliverable nuclear weapon. I think the preponderance on the motivational character is that the, at a minimum, the Iranians want the capacity to be able to produce one, if not the weapon itself. It's an analytical point, and I, and I don't want to monopolize the discussion. We really have to get to questions, but it, it is, it's important. Your point, Trita, is really critical. Expand the options. I mean, if every problem is, is uh, if you only have a hammer, then every problem is the, is the proverbial nail, and that's the way we think about things. There's no question. But we also can't forget the other piece of this. I would, I would like to continue uh, to follow up with you, what, what you ask. And it's a very important. We all speak about the nuclear project, but there is another project, and this is development of ballistic missiles which can deliver it. Today, today, Delhi, Moscow, and Athens are inside the range of the Iranian missiles. The next phase of development, which may take maybe another two years, most of Western Europe will be under this range of missiles. So if you ask me about the implication, the leverage of a nuclear blackmail will apply to many important countries. And if you remember that the declared ambition of the regime is to be 
the defender of the Muslim, you can imagine what leverage the ambition to defend Muslim would have. But now I want to address another point, is the issue of the enrichment. You take the discussion to the very technical uh, issue of enrichment. The problem is not that we are beyond this point, and why? The amount of, of, of uh, enriched, low enriched uranium is very high now. What the regime prepared is a huge number, Ahmadinejad himself said 9,000, of centrifuge. How you produce the material for a bomb? By spinning quickly as many centrifuges as you can with the largest raw material that you have. The issue of the enrichment is, be, is actually beyond because they need between six months to a year to take what they have and to turn it to a military grade uranium. That's the point. They are beyond it. The, the, is, the issue of they cross the threshold of enrichment to a point that they are in a very short distance from a bomb. So th the, the issue is not the technical problem of enrichment, but where this regime is leading to. To what strategic goals he need the long-range missiles, the bombs. That's the question. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a seminar on, on uh, nuclear physics. It's about geopolitics and the fate of, the, of, of, of nations, <coughs> and Israel is not the only one, because <coughs> the gentleman ma mentioned the, the Gulf countries. The Gulf countries, Bahrain, UAE, they are under threat, <coughs> not less than Israel. Fortunately, we have the ability to, to confront this threat, but we are not the only one. Aaron. Do, do, uh, Quick response. I mean, tiny, this is a good a tiny one. Too. Tiny one. <coughs> this has turned into a seminar on fuzzy physics, Ephraim. Uh, because at the end of the day, if you are focused on the intentions, you're left either with bombing or an ability to monitor and verify what they're doing. As, as uh, President Reagan said when he signed the agreements with the Soviets, he talked about um, trust but verify. In the case of Iran, we should probably mistrust and verify. But in the absence of any verification, you have no way of being able to make any real judgments about the intentions of the other side. Uh, even if you bomb, and this is the other thing, we talk sometimes about a military solution. That's quite a charitable way of describing it. It's at best a military option. It's not a guaranteed solution to, um, to receive that title. Even in that case, in the previous situations that we've had, all that it has done, it has doubled and tripled the exact desire that you pointed out, which is for them to get the nuclear deterrence. The perspective of the administration, and they've made it quite public in the last couple of weeks, is that if there is military action, we are more likely to see a nuclear weapon state in Iran within two years than we are if we continue on a path of trying to find a diplomatic solution. May I ask you a blunt question, almost a personal question? Mm -hmm. You are the chairman of the Iranian-American uh, asso Association, right? What is your opinion about the regime? My opinion of the regime, as I said earlier on, that this is a deeply repressive, undemocratic regime. Uh, but I find it somewhat not convincing to hear that one cares a lot about the Iranian people while one talks about taking military action against the country or by imposing the strictest crippling sanctions against the country, that a pain that would be borne not by the regime but by the people. What is your recommendation so, for action? I, look, Dr. Parsi, I read every single publication of your organization. You are diligent enough to send me by mail, and I am diligent enough to read it. And I <laughs> fail And to email me comments at times, which and I, I appreciate. And I fail, and I read it, and I fail to find what is your operational recommendation? Solution. Absolutely. Re recommendation. Because I see you are, you are ag against uh, military option. You are against sanctions. On the other hand, you say it's a repressive, undemocratic regime. Do you think that this regime will voluntarily relinquish power at some point? 
in spite of your talking points, Ephraim, I think I have far more faith in the Iranian people than you do. Because I believe that the Iranian people will deal with this regime, get rid of this regime, and Iran will reach democracy. But the history of Iran has shown that when you have these tensions with the outside world, that has repressed and pushed back the pro-democracy movement in Iran. It made it more difficult for them, their space, in order to pursue what they were doing more successfully in the early 2000s, have become almost minimalized as a combination of the repressiveness of the regime, the further mil militarization of the regime, which all are wedded with an increased tensions with the outside world. If Israel really wants to see a democratic Iran, rest assured, bombing Iran is not going to bring that about, nor is it going to bring back the friendship that existed between the Iranian people uh, and the Jewish people prior to the 1979 revolution. As I say in my first comment, bombing Iran is not, is not my desire. I say it a thousand times, it's the, it's the last resort, and from all the reasons, I would like to avoid it if possible. But how you think that without sanctions a, that make Iran ingovernable, this regime will, 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 will be toppled? How it can happen? By, by courting? Because actually what you recommend is keeping the courting of the regime, offering them more incentive. Say at least yeah. some hold incentive hold on, hold on. for the Iranian people, not for the Iranian regime. If you take a look at what actually has happened, the greatest amount of flux inside of Iran incidentally coincided in 2009 when the U.S. significantly reduced the pressure. I don't think that is a coincidence. I think there's a, a connection between the two. Furthermore, you're assuming that sanctions actually bring about democracy. We have 10 cases of states that have had a level of intense embargo-like sanctions uh, that we currently are pursuing on Iran. In 10 of those cases, only one only one has democratized, and that was South Africa. In the 35 cases in which non-democracies have transitioned to democracy since 1955, only one was under these form of sanctions. All of the others transitioned in the absence of sanctions. So this connection of believing that sanctions bring about democracy is highly unconvincing because there isn't any empirical evidence to support it. Aaron mentioned something very important in the beginning, to pursue policies that have a good combination or what reality is and what we like to see. I think this is toward, turning more towards what we like to see with any absence of empirical support for it. I feel uneasy because of writer Omari, we... You need to get into the conversation here. We did something very, very, but I, I, I would like to, to refer to, to this point because the bad precedents, like Cuba, for instance, like Cuba, does, n does not mean that the best bloodless way to bring down the regime is by making it hard to grant the country. To make it difficult for the regime. Uh, Impose targeted sanctions that target the decision the makers failure in instead Cuba of the people. To justify, to justify being cute to the, to, 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 to the Ayatollahs. And I think that we have to give you right the right, you, the right for, for the Palestinians. Look, I mean, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a physicist, so I don't understand uh, these conversations. All I can understand <laughs> is, uh, look, I mean, first of all, from my point of view, with all respect, it's not about democracy, it's not about the, Palestine, the Iranian people, it is about interests. And what I'm hearing you saying is I should trust an uncertain process whereby the Iranians might or might not at some point uh, arise against their government and this will change the uh, equation. In the meantime, every indication is the Iranian uh, regime is pursuing nuclear weapons. That's my sense. Uh, so uh, trusting that this is gonna change through a more kind of uh, lovey-dovey approach, I'm not quite sure that's uh, gonna work. Uh, at the end of the day, I think as the gentleman there said, there is huge costs to uh, a nuclear Iran, unpredictable costs. And if you look at the behavior of Iran so far, at least in the Arab world, it's support uh, for certain organizations, and you said we are giving too much credence to uh, Iran's influence. I would say that uh, Hezbollah and Hamas and others, yes, they would still exist, and yes, they will be uh, unfriendly to Iran and to, uh, to Israel and to others, but at the end, they will not be as capable of inflicting what they've inflicted without the Iranian uh, support and encouragement. And even until today, we have other organizations like Islamic Jihad and what have you that are not beyond using a lot of uh, unpleasant things to achieve certain goals. So I personally, I am for the view that you have to push hard, and at the end of the day, the question, we have a very 
limited time to act, <coughs> as I agree with Ephraim, ultimately the military is not the preferred option and the consequence is very hard and is very high, but at the end of the day, a nuclear Iran and the way it's gonna transform the Arab and the map, the regional map, and ultimately our interests uh, in the region, we cannot be left simply to, uh, you know, let's trust the Iranian people to change uh, their government. That's my view of this. We have time, I think, for two, one, one additional question. <laughs> one additional question. Tarek Rumbeg, I'm the head of the Iran delegation of the European Parliament. And I would like to come back to the question of uranium enrichment because I, I believe that this is the only way there is a diplomatic breakthrough. And it's not a technical question of the uranium enrichment, it's the politics of uranium enrichment. And, <coughs> and here I was interested to hear that, that the Obama administration has not said zero enrichment. And <coughs> actually many of the other countries in the B5 plus one have not said uh, zero enrichment. So there is still hope. I think there's a possibility of compromise. The Iranians will never accept zero enrichment because they think, and it is true, that according to international treaties, they have the right to enrich for peaceful purposes. So this is one of the things. The other thing is that the uranium enrichment is so much in the Iranian uh, identity today that actually saying zero enrichment would, would be a suicide for, for anyone. So there has to be some kind of acceptance of peaceful purposes. And this can be done, the inspectors can do it, and the question is, would Israel ever be uh, ever accept a limited degree of uranium enrichment in Iran, as they have the right in the NPT treaty? So, you represent the European uh, Parliament, I understand. For years, in the last 15 years, during I think 10 years, the European countries did exactly that they negotiated with the Iranian regime about the enrichment, about variation, and finally they came to the conclusion that the smart, very smart Ayatollahs used this negotiation to gain time. The, you called it critical dialogue, but in a certain point, all the, the, the West European leaders, the French, the German, the British, who so advocated the, the, this dialogue, this negotiation about enrichment, they discovered that they were cheated. They used the, the regime, used the time to progress towards weaponized uh, uranium. So there is no sense to go back to this futile uh, uh, talks about uh, about enrichment. This is not the case. Now, because the, 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 the sanctions of this administration started to be effective, started to be affected, effective, now they are asking, let's go back to the game of gaining time. No, madam. No. <laughs> no. When there is a secular and democratic Iran, let them have all the technologies in the world whatever they like, not, not this regime, not this regime which despise the culture and the values of your society, if you don't know it. We have come to the end of the hour. Please uh, join me in thanking our panelists for a fascinating discussion. <laughs>